Hi, welcome back. Today I'm going to be talking about diagnosing and treating asthma and COPD. I will share with you some tricks that I use to keep these straight for the board's exam and also some tools that will be really useful for us entering into practice as new nurse practitioners. If you have any comments or questions or requests, please leave them down below in the comment section. And as always with this series of videos, I will have a dump sheet on the very last slide covering all the essentials for your knowledge going into the board's exam. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you found it helpful. And without further ado, on to asthma and COPD. So my discussion of asthma here is going to be for the adult and adolescent. And the literature defines that as patients 12 years and older. So how are we going to diagnose asthma in our patients? Well, they're going to come in typically symptomatic. Symptoms are going to include things like wheezing, chest tightness, nighttime coughing, presence of triggers, a family history of asthma, and these symptoms, they are reoccurring and obviously unrelated to infectious process. We'll make sure that we rule that out. Um, so spirometry is going to be used for asthma diagnosis as well. And as a good provider, we should always make sure that we're actually getting a baseline spirometry reading so we know our patients normal when they are well. So if you're unfamiliar, spirometry involves the patient inhaling and then exhaling very deeply, and it measures the forced expiratory volume, the FEV1, and then the forced vital capacity, or the FVC. And we're going to see these a lot in COPD and asthma, these terms, so become familiar with them. The FEV1, FVC ratio, if it is less than 0 0.7, 0 0.7. This is indicating an airflow obstruction. And that number right there is going to be really important for you to remember for your board. So just kind of put that back in your brain. And then a 12% increase in the FEV1 post bron bronchodilator. That's highly suggestive of asthma. So we have a reading before they get their treatment, their albuterol, and then a reading after. And there is actually a 12% increase in their FEV1 that is highly indicative of asthma. So managing our asthma patients, UpToDate gives us four components that we really need to focus on for properly taking care of these patients. One is gonna be patient education and that's that's huge because it's a lot that they need to learn. So things like how to properly use their inhaler, uh, triggers to avoid, when to use their medications, um, of course, and we'll actually go into this in the next slide, but having an asthma action plan is like huge for um, reducing exacerbations and hospitalizations in the future. So two, like I just mentioned, controlling for those asthma triggers. Three, monitoring of the lung function and changes in symptoms. That again is gonna help us reduce the risk of exacerbation and hospitalization. And then four, medication. And then obviously we wanna do so in a way that has the least amount of side effects. So here is that ac uh, asthma action plan that I was talking about for educating our patient. If you can see here on the right, this is an example I got from UpToDate, which is super awesome. But as you can see, there's a lot to digest here. So we will really need to educate our patient and go over this with our patient so that we make sure that they're using it properly. Otherwise, it does us no good. It's a vital component to patient education, and it's key in helping to prevent exacerbations and hospitalizations, which is what we as primary care providers are all about. So this slide is simply for your reference, and it's not on. It's not going to be, I don't believe, on your board's exam, it because it's discussing how to use a peak flow meter, and if you don't know, how are you supposed to be able to educate your patients? So simply here for your re, uh, resource, and it also talks about how the patient needs to find their personal best number, and this is kind of what we base everything off of. Uh, everything off of when we are determining how they're doing at that time we need to know their personal best what their normal is so it's just really useful I got it from the asthma and allergy foundation of America you can look it up here there's the link you can you know whatever screenshot it unless you're familiar then skip this but yeah that's for you so classifying asthma it becomes really intuitive once you get familiar it follows a very step-by-step -step approach with diagnosing and treating so step one is intermittent asthma. 
the patient has daytime asthma or has to use their rescue inhaler no more than two times a week and no more than two times a month are they being woke up by their asthma symptoms. Their FEV1 is in within normal range outside of any asthma exacerbations that they might have, which is a value of 80% or more than predicted. And there's been an episode, no more than one time use of glucocorticoids for an exacerbation that year. So those are kind of some numbers to try and remember. Mild asthma, step two, and it just kind of gradually grows from that. So it starts out with no more than two times a week and two times a month. Now, step two is more than two times a week, but not every day. More than two times a month, but less than weekly. Their FEV1 is still within normal range outside of those asthma exacerbations, and there's minimal interference with their activities of daily life related to their asthma symptoms. Step three, now we're going to get obviously a little worse. There's daily symptoms of asthma, daily use of asaba, and weekly nocturnal symptoms. Their FEV1 is decreased in this group anywhere between 60 and less than 80, and their, their asthma is definitely interfering with their daily living. Severe asthma, or step four and five, kind of just get lumped together there. These patients are experiencing symptoms every day and every night. They are miserable. It, it interjects in all aspects of their life. And now, medicating our patients with asthma also follows a step-by-step -step approach. And it really kind of makes it easy to follow once you get the hang of it again. So step one is intermediate intermittent asthma, so not persistent. Intermittent asthma, and we always start with our Saba, which is our short-acting beta agonist, or albuterol. Step two, mild persistent asthma. So then we add on, we go to our steroids, our low-dose inhaled corticosteroids plus our Saba as needed. Step three, moderate persistent asthma, still low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. Now we add on a LABA or a long acting beta agonist and we still have, we always keep our SABA now PRN. They always have that rescue inhaler. Step four, severe persistent asthma. Now we're stepping up on our steroids. So medium dose inhaled corticosteroid plus a LABA plus a SABA. Step five, again, severe persistent and this is just us trying to properly medicate. Now we're titrating up our inhaled corticosteroids more to a more of a higher dose, plus our LABA, plus our SABA PRN. And then I came up with this phrase, and this is how I remember it still. It just stuck with me really well. SABA is life, and it's really appropriate because obviously SABA is life, you know, those it's life-saving. So SABA is life, and the is obviously stands for the inhaled corticosteroids, life for LABAs, and then so step, so you have your one, two, three there with just that phrase. Four and five, all we're doing now is titrating up on our steroids in a nutshell. And then I put here at the bottom LABA, everything else that ends in that terol um, ending there is going to be a long acting beta agonist. Albuterol, that's our SABA. Everything else that looks similar, that ends in that terol, is your long-acting beta agonist. And there are some alternatives for this, but this is the basics. This is what you really need to know for your boards. And these next couple slides are just reinforcing what we just talked about with our step-up treatment for asthma. Step one, that intermittent asthma, that's going to be your SABA PRM, and that's albuterol. I put in here for your reference, though, this is too new for boards, but really useful. So new guidelines are being introduced or have been introduced by the Global Initiative for Asthma that suggests that using a combo inhaler, a combination of a low-dose glucocorticoid and a LABA for, uh, for Mutterol, using that as a rescue inhaler or along with like a SABA. Research is suggesting that the use of this combo inhaler might help with the chronic inflammation that is usually associated with asthma and then overall could decrease mortality associated with asthma. So important for us to know, but too new for your board's exam. For the 
rescue inhaler, they're going to ask, you're going to need to answer Saba. Step two is in regards to those patients with mild asthma, and that is when we introduce the inhaled low-dose glucocorticoids, um, or research says that we can try a combo glucocorticoid or a LABA inhaler at this time. Um, but no, at step two, we're introducing stero uh, those inhaled steroids. And then I put some examples here. The long-acting beta agonists or the LABAs examples here are listed, uh, glucocorticoids listed, and those always end in O-N-E, own. Those are our steroids. And then some examples of combo inhalers, which we've all seen, Advair, Simbicort. Those are some really popular ones. So, But yeah, step two, add a low-dose glucocorticoid inhaled. Step three, moderate asthma. Saba is life. Three is when we add on the L or the long-acting beta agonist. And then steps four and five is in regards to treating patients with severe asthma. And this is going to be where we're titrating up on our inhaled corticosteroids. Medium dose, high dose, it's pretty intuitive. And then these patients, we're definitely going to want to refer them. And then when else would we want to refer to pulmonology? Their um, up-to-date gives you some examples of when it's appropriate to refer. A history of intubation or a life-threatening asthma exacerbation definitely warrants a referral. Um, needing oral, glu oral glucocorticoids more than twice a year, or if a patient is unable to stop taking those without retur um, return of symptom, that definitely warrants a referral. And then poor asthma control after three to six months of trialing medications and close monitoring. If it's not improving and if you're not able to manage it, then refer those patients. And then I got this from up to date and included this simply for your reference as well. This, is, this shows you some of the alternatives for treatment and really aren't going to be what you need to focus on for boards, but Important for, to know for practice, obviously. Like step four, they have an alternative there where they add on uh, teotropium. Um, of course, so at this point, we're hoping those patients are referred unless, of course, you're doing pulmonology. But yeah, so this is just for your reference. All right, so on to COPD. We've all probably taken care of hundreds of patients with this, or at least I know I have. <laughs> um, this is an umbrella term for bronchitis, emphysema, or chronic obstructive asthma. Patients with COPD, um, it's a progressive dyspnea, a chronic productive cough, chronic sputum production. This is usually a diagnosis or always a diagnosis later in life. And if they have any of these symptoms, of course, this warrants an evaluation for COPD. The gold standard, and we mentioned this number earlier, I I told you to tuck it away in your brain. Again, it pops up in here, and you really are going to need to know it because it is the gold standard for diagnosing COPD, and that is a FEV1, FVC ratio less than 0 0.7 post bronchodilator. If that is on your test, that is the answer. So, and it is a gold standard means lots of research and data support it. Patients' severity of COPD is classified based on symptoms, risk for exacerbations, and then the patient's score on the COPD assessment test, or a CAT is the acronym you'll see a lot. And then the choice of treatment is going to depend exactly on those results. So we'll see those next. So on the left-hand side here of the slide is the CAT, or the COPD assessment test. I got this off of, I put the link down there. You can ac I access it through UpToDate as a provider. There, I think the general public can also access this, but this is the test, and I might have been shown this in school, though I don't remember, so I just thought it was really good to kind of look it over. And then... For COPD, it's divide, they're, the patients are going to be divided into groups, group A, group B, group C, and group D. And I listed them there on the side. So group A has mild symptoms a, and a low risk of exacerbation, meaning they've had zero to maybe one um, hospitalization in the last year related to COPD. And their CAT score is less than 10. So these are pretty... Um, mild cases. Group B 
is more moderate to severe symptoms even, but a low risk of exacerbation. And that's based again on their um, history of being hospitalized and they've had zero to one in the last year. And a CAT score is gonna be of course greater than 10, they're more symptomatic. And then group C are for patients with more mild symptoms, but a high risk of exacerbation. So now two or more times in the last year, they've been hospitalized related to a COPD exacerbation, but a CAT score less than 10 because they're not as symptomatic. Group D, moderate to severe symptoms, high risk of exacerbation at least twice or more in the last year, and a CAT score 10 or greater because they are symptomatic and that is obviously the most severe of the groups. Does anybody remember this from nursing school? I know that I used these like pictures a lot when trying to remember the diseases and I still feel like they're really applicable especially when you're taking your boards and how they phrase these patients but you have um, your pink puffer and your blue bloater and so uh, the blue bloater is the chronic bronchitis. They're usually more overweight, they have the coughing, the they make them blue because they're cyanotic, because they're hypoxic. Emphysema is usually more frail looking, older, thinner, hyperinflation. Uh, the diaphragms on x-ray. So still really applicable just to kind of remember in your head all the different traits that go along with these and how they are different from one another. And I still think it's useful for your board. So I just remember these from nursing school. Anyone else? So COPD meds, we have some of the same, some new. Um, in, inhaled anticholinergics. This is new to this class. This medication class helps to prevent bronchoconstriction by blocking the action of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors. That is its mechanism of action. So there is a short-acting anti-muscarinic or a SAMA, and that's the ipratropium. And then a long-acting anti-muscarinic or a LAMA is the teotropium. And then there's some others that are listed in parentheses, but those are the two big ones that you'll need to know. And then there's some combinations down here, Asama and Asaba, Alama and Ala. Yeah, you can read that sounds funny. But we're familiar, I'm sure, with a lot of these meds. I came up with a phrase in my mind, I um, have COPD from smoking. I um, have COPD from smoking. It helps me to remember the I am, um, the ending to those drugs, the ipotropium, the teotropium for COPD. And patients with COPD, they are smokers or they were smokers. It's just a huge part of the disease. And also, one of the best things that we can do as providers to prevent the disease from progressing is if is to promote smoking cessation if they're still smoking. If that pops up on your boards, that's important to remember. Smoking cessation is key in this patient population. And then for remembering the ipratropium, teotropium, remembering I, I always think I before T, I, come, I comes before T in the alphabet. So ipratropium is the short acting and then the teotropium for the long acting. COPD treatment, of course, like we mentioned, depends on how that patient's symptoms, risk of exacerbation, and their CAT score, and that places that patient in a group A, group B, group C, group D. And the literature um, supports this right here. So for group A, Saba or Asama, and remember that Saba was the, or the Sama was the short-acting anti-muscarinic, and then group B is now instead, in comparison, we're adding the L, LABA or LAMA, plus the rescue inhaler PRN. Group C, then we step up to inhaled corticosteroids. So that's like your big difference there with asthma and COPD is when we're adding on the steroids and the LABAs, and so they kind of flip-flop. So, And then group D, you're doing it everything. <laughs> inhaled corticosteroids, a long-acting beta agonist, a long-acting anti-muscarinic, plus their uh, rescue inhaler PRN. And so my phrase in my head, so remember for asthma, Saba is life, and that is short-acting beta, beta agonist, inhaled corticosteroids, 
long-acting beta agonist. Saba is life. Now, with COPD treatment, Saba literally is life-saving. Saba literally is life-saving. We're still starting with our Saba, our short-acting something. We still have our first rescue inhaler, whether it be a Saba or a Sama. Literally, we're adding in the long-acting agents now, either the long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting anti-muscarinic. Is still with our steroids. Now we have... Now we're introducing a steroid and a LABA or a LAMA still, plus a SABA. Group D is everything. There's no more OR. We have everything on board here. We have inhaled corticosteroids. We have your long-acting uh, beta agonist, long-acting mus- anti-muscarinic, and then your short-acting beta agonist or anti-muscarinic. So SABA literally is life-saving for your COPD treatment of patients. So here's some important key points to remember for managing our patients with COPD. Um, Screening annual low-dose CT scan for current smokers between the ages of 55 and 80 years old with a 30-pack history of smoking or if they have quit smoking within the last 15 years. So they're going to be getting those low-dose CT scans, and of course, we're looking for malignancy. And then... To go with that, supraclavicular nodes, those are highly associated with malignancy. So if we find those, we want to be thinking in that way. And then if our COPD patient is still smoking, like I mentioned earlier, the best thing that we can do for our patients to slow the progression of their disease is to help them with their smoking cessation. So what about our patients with a COPD exacerbation? Well, first, what is a COPD exacerbation? It's simply worsening of that patient's normal COPD symptoms, and that could include an increase in frequency of quality or severity of cough, increase in sputum production, and then just worsening of that shortness of breath, dyspnea. All of those symptoms progressing from their normal is a sign of a COPD exacerbation. Often these times, um, often these exacerbations are precipitated by an infection, and usually it's a respiratory infection. There are risk factors for patients um, that put them at a greater risk for having a COPD exacerbation. That's age, of course, our older population, um, longer duration of a COPD diagnosis, uh, productive cough, cough with a hyper hypersecretion, uh, hospitalization due to COPD exacerbate, exacerbation within the last year, the use of theophylline, which is a drug that is sometimes used with the COPD population, and then comorbids, for example, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. So our diagnosis or a diagnostic process, where there's a lot of things obviously at play that we'll have to take into account based on the patient's, the way they look, their HPI. Things we'll be assessing are things like um, oxygenation status. We might need a portable chest x-ray. Of course, we'll do the PA view, and I always remember that P for pulmonary, um, we want to rule out pneumonia, cardiomyopathy, a pneumothorax. Um, we can get an ECG to rule out any cardiac etiology. Labs can include things like CBC, CMP, BUN, creatinine, troponins, BNP. So there's a lot to do with these patients. They're obviously um, a very heavy caseload. And then treatment includes things like a SABA or a SAMA for mild exacerbations. And then if it's more of a severe case, um, we might include antibiotics or steroids. or, And then those severe exacerbations too, really, they just need to go straight to the ER. And then as promised, our final slide here is the asthma and COPD dump sheet. Tricks to help you remember and keep them differentiated in your mind. Everything here I feel like is very relevant for studying for your board's exam. So go ahead, screenshot this and print it or whatever, but this will be a great study tool for you. And then as always, um, remember to leave any comments or requests down below. And if you found this helpful at all, please subscribe to my channel. My next video will be all about the musculoskeletal system, different maneuvers and tricks for practice to help you with your diagnosis in an outpatient setting. And then of course, to prepare you for your nurse practitioner board's exam. So I will talk to you guys soon. I hope you have a fabulous day. Bye.